Chapter One of Neighbours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Fletcher, 2017. Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. Chapter One. Yes, I guess it looks full as well plain like that as any of them fancy ways, mused Miss Bennet, as she gazed at the neat black lettering on its white ground, which proclaimed her name and occupation to a waiting world. Looks real professional and up to date, commented the man in blue overalls, who had just affixed the sign to the corner of Miss Bennet's weather-beaten little house. Them that runs can read, as it says in the Bible. You ain't had a regular sign all these years, Miss Malvina, but tain't hard to guess why you come to it now. <laughs> all I got to say is, I don't blame you none. Miss Bennet screwed her small features to one side in a comprehensive sniff of disdain. I don't know what you're a-hintin' at, Henry Pratt, she said with dignity. I've been thinking of having that sign painted for years and years off and on, it's one of them things a body'll put off, like making up their shroud with the goods a layin' idle in their bureau drawer. Mr. Pratt spat controversially upon the ground. Course you heard there's a new dressmaking shop opened up over George Trimmer's store, said he, shifting his quid of tobacco with stealthy enjoyment. I bet I heard it before you did, retorted Miss Bennet. I knowed it before she had time to oil up her sewing machine. Not that she's had much use for it since. My customers ain't the kind to be drawed off that way. Land, if you was to see my shop, it's so crown full of work, I don't know which way to turn. Well, anyway, it's a handsome sign you've got there, and I hope it'll be worth a dollar seventy-five to your business, observed Mr. Pratt, in the act of gathering his scattered tools. It looks real dignified and like that, I think, assented the dressmaker. Ma, she got all head up argufying for Malvina Bennett, female tailoress. <laughs> but Ma's kind of narrow-minded. Female tailoress, I says. Don't cover all I do in the line of dressmaking in a single day, let alone a year. I remember Mrs. Deaconess Buckthorn was in the shop looking over the spring fashions, and she remarks in that deep prayer meeting voice o' hern, I should advise the words, Miss Bennet, Mantua maker. Twould be comprehensive and elegant, she says. Land, I says, what on earth is a Mantua? I never made up one of them in my life as I know of, I says. A dollar seventy five cents is dirt cheap for a neat, tasty sign like that, stated Mr. Pratt. "'And you couldn't have done no better than what you have done in the wording of it. "'When you stepped into my shop two weeks ago yesterday, I says to you—' "'Your memory's better than your word, Henry,' interrupted Miss Bennet. "'You promised me solemn you'd get that sign up on the corner of my house inside of three days. "'If it hadn't have been I was looking for you from day to day, "'I might have changed my mind at the last minute, "'and had Malvina robes at Mantuos. "'Twould have looked real stylish, and might have drawed custom.' Mr. Pratt frugally salvaged half a dozen nails from under the sprouting daffodils under Miss Bennet's window. "'Maybe that's right,' he conceded dubiously. "'Women folk generally runs after what's new and fancy. "'The lady over Trimmer's store's got a black and gold sign "'that reads something like that. And nothing would do for my wife when she seed it but to have her spring suit made by the new dressmaker. Angry tears rushed to Miss Malvina's faded eyes. Do you mean to tell me that Sarah Ann Pratt's been to that that critter to have a dress made? she demanded. And me doing for her constant since before she married her first husband, and making up her mourning and all. Her voice choked. Oh, you might as well hear it from me as from anybody else, grumbled Mr. Pratt, realising his tactical blunder too late. I ain't got no monopoly in the sign-painting trade, and I don't see how you can expect to do all the dressmaking for the women folk in this here growing community. Competition's the sole of trade, you know. Uh, say, I, I got a bill here for the sign. 
if you feel like paying it right now same as you agreed to when you ordered it off me i'll take off ten cents miss bennett instantly produced a half sheet of blue lined note paper from beneath her shawl i could have paid your hard money right in your fist just as well as not henry pratt and i might have done it if mrs pratt had been honourable enough to tell me right to my face she was going to another dressmaker but seeing as she ain't no lady here's the items one card of black hooks and eyes half a yard of feather bone besides my time and three quarters of a yard mr pratt paused in the act of extracting a much needed red and white bandana handkerchief from the hip pocket of his overalls to stare resentfully at the dressmaker well i like your nerve he exploded wrathfully i guess my wife'll pass for a lady for all of you malvina bennett she never signed up no contract to let you spoil her best clothes constant as i know of for pity's sake cried miss bennett deep scorn struggling with the grief in her voice if ever i spoiled a dress for sarah ann pratt and her with one hip two inches higher than the other to say nothing of being hollered in where she ought to be rounded out and vice versa in the back where her shoulder blades is sprung i defy you to bring that there dress to my shop and prove it prove it i say right in front of me oh go along muttered mr pratt disgustedly i clean forgot what my wife told me she said you'd be ramping and roaring like a ball of bashin if i let on about her going to the new dressmaker but she ain't the only one i can tell you ramping and roaring ain't my habit of speech henry pratt rebuked miss bennett and you can tell mrs sign painter pratt so this here bill is for a black dress waist i fixed over for her to wear to her first husband's sister-in-law's funeral she it was emmeline mills sarah ann was feeling terrible grief-stricken i remember being took back to the happy days before she married you henry and i set up most of all one night so she could have the waist in time and she ain't never paid for it from that date to this and here it is a dollar seventy-five for works and findings why didn't you show me your dratted bill when you come to my shop to order the sign inquired mr pratt in a deeply injured tone you never so much as mentioned it i was a little too cute for that henry <laughs> crowed miss bennett i know full well i wouldn't get my sign till gabriel blowed his trumpet if you suspicioned you owed me anything no more you wouldn't neither confirmed mr pratt gloomily i got a darn good mind to smash it what my sign try it and i'll get the law on you promised miss bennett tain't no better than getting money on false pretences growled mr pratt and that'll make you liable if i was a mind to sue you miss bennett cackled derisively i hope you've got some sense left henry receipt that there bill o yourn i'll do the same in mine and we're quits as far as money's concerned she watched the man's retreating figure well out of sight and then with the receipted bill tightly clutched in one hand and the skirt of her dress in the other she mounted the front steps of the house pausing to gaze once more at the subject of her late spirited controversy with mr pratt i bet i ketched an awful cold standing in the wind all this while she reflected i can feel it shooting up my jaw this minute but i don't care i got my sign and it's paid for she sneezed a noisy confirmation of her forebodings as she passed into the shop where sat old mrs bennett patiently pulling white basting threads from the inchoate garment in her aproned lap oh for goodness sake ma if you ain't drawed them bastings from around the arm sizes protested the little dressmaker and me taking such pains to get the lining and the gathered goods on the outside just so now malvini don't you suppose i know what i'm about demanded the old lady keeping fast hold of the disputed garment didn't i teach you everything you know about dressmaking i'd like to know you're an ungrateful child that's what you be malviny bennett and there's a verse in the bible about a serpent's tooth i know ma i oughtn't to a spoke so brash but i got kind of riled with henry pratt of all the mean-spirited men-folk i ever see he's the beaten best 
if you just so open eye on to this here waistband ma while i tack them gathers in place the old lady was rocking herself back and forth her ancient nose in the air her voice cracked and querulous with anger oh i couldn't so much as set a hook and eye to the waistband to suit you malviny i don't know nothin about sewing cordin to you you can't trust me with nothin soon as your back's turned i spoil everything i guess i won't do no more sewing this side of heaven oh now ma don't take on her daughter exhorted her i got to get this here morning wrapper done so's to take it over to philuri pettibone this afternoon she'll pay me right off and then i can settle up with obed salter i ain't never owed him such a bill as i do now just as soon as i can tack this here shirin so it won't get skewgeed i'll boil the kettle and make you a good hot cup of tea i don't want no tea grumbled the old lady you always seem to think malviny that you can pacify me no matter how sassy you been with a cup of tea that last tea you got from salters ain't worth puttin in the pot i'd as soon drink hay water miss bennett sighed as her skilful needle flew in and out repairing the unthinking ravages of her surviving parent oh i'll i'll try and get some nice green and black mixed next time i go to boston she promised vaguely i seen a robin this morning ma settin still or flyin oh flyin right over toward the parsonage mm, if you see em settin still pursued mrs bennett or up on the ground it's an awful bad sign for the whole year malviny but this one was flyin way up high but it was going from you malviny piped the old lady your luck was flying from you if you'd only seen it coming towards you now i'm awful careful not to look for robins no more in the spring of the year but don't seem to change my luck now ma protested miss malvina it really don't seem right for christian folks to take so much stock in signs and like that why if i was to notice every little thing the way a pin lays on the floor when you pick it up and dropping a dish towel or seeing the moon over my left shoulder i wouldn't you know i guess i'd go crazy we're a going to have good luck for all the robins in town i'll bet we get the house painted up scrumptious this year and maybe new letters to the back door and like as not a regular bathroom with a kerosene eater all complete how do you like that ma i ain't never felt better than i do this spring i ain't had our scarcely twinge of rheumatiz all winter and i'm full of spring and ginger better knock on wood malviny advised the old lady sourly you'll be flat on your back first you know all twisted up with rheumatiz miss bennett swiftly obeyed her thimbled finger beating a smart rat-a-tat on the window-sill i don't see what knockin on wood can do to prevent it she murmured a body ud think there was some spiteful person lurkin and listenin around all ready to pounce on a body if they should forget i wouldn't lay such actions to the devil to say nothin o god all i know is if folk don't knock on wood when they get braggarty something's sure to happen to em stated mrs bennett positively i seen it over and over again why i remember the winter your poor pa passed away he was telling deacon scrimger how awful smart he was ain't had a sick time this winter says he you better knock on wood pa i says to him but he was feeling contrary like men folks generally do when there's other men folks around and he pipes up and he says i ain't going to make a fool of myself no more that way to please you ma them was his very words and he set there solid on his chair like a heathen idol i won't do it ma says he real earnest well pa he says mournful i'll do it for you but i'm afraid twon't help you none when you're took bad all of a sudden i says twas the very next day he took to his bed i knew there wasn't no hope from the very first so i picked out the funeral hymns and i says to pa there that's done 
interrupted her daughter in an aggressively cheerful tone. Now, I'm going to whirl in and get something to eat before folks begins to drop in. And I wish you'd step out and look at the sign right now, Ma, so you can act kind of calm and indifferent. I declare I can feel that sign all through my system like a girl would her engagement ring. But I suppose we'll get used to it after a spell. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was five o'clock that same afternoon before Miss Bennet set forth, a flat parcel done up in newspaper containing Mrs. Pettibone's complete garment on her arm. Greatly to her surprise, no one had called to congratulate her on the new sign. Nobody, apparently, had so much as noticed it. Yet there it was, the one conspicuously new and fresh object on the weather-beaten front of the little house. Malvina Bennett, dressmaker. Tain't as if them lilac bushes was in the way, cogitated Miss Bennett. A body can't help seeing it whichever way they come. Tain't so to say showy and like that, but it's neat and it's got style to it like my sewing. I don't care what anybody says to the contrary. But if all my customers was to flock to that critter over Trimmer's store for their spring suits, what with more and more of them taking ready maids, Miss Bennett bit off the thread of her unhappy hypothesis like a length of thread. I'll bet it's a lot more unlucky to harbour fears and forebodings than to forget to knock on wood, she told herself resolutely. Like enough, Pa was scared into a fit of sickness if all was knowed. <laughs> Land, I'd rather knock on wood to my dying day than have Ma pick out my funeral hymns premature. She was still nerving herself to meet future adversity when she arrived at the parsonage gate. If I tell Falura, I mean Mrs. Reverend Pettibone, maybe she can put me on the right track, meditated the little dressmaker. There don't seem to be nothing Philura can't get out of the surrounding atmosphere. Now take that baby. Land, I hope it comes to town all right. Maybe I'd better knock on wood. No one answered her modest summons at the front door, and after a discreet pause she ventured a second pull at the old-fashioned bell handle. I can hear it ring inside, she assured herself as she listened with bent head. Anyway, she wouldn't be going out now. It was the minister himself who presently opened the door. Mr. Pettibone appeared pale, almost haggard, and his iron-grey hair stood up in wild confusion above his forehead. He stared uncomprehendingly at Miss Bennet. "'I come to bring Mrs. Pettibone's morning wrapper,' she said timidly. "'I've been quite a spell getting it all finished off, but... Here it is at last, and I hope she'll like it. She thrust the parcel into Mr. Pettibone's unwilling hand and turned to go away. Oh, um, <clears throat> Miss Malvina. Something in the minister's voice challenged attention. Miss Bennett paused tentatively on the doorstep. I, um, <clears throat> I'm sure Mrs. Pettibone would wish... Uh, in short, won't you step in for a moment? Miss Bennet obeyed, and the two stood facing each other in the semi-obscurity of the passage. I, <clears throat> I, possibly you have been aware. A sound from above stairs interrupted the minister's speech, a sound once heard, never to be forgotten. It was the weak yet raucous protest of a human being newly introduced to this world of strife. Miss Bennet clasped her hands in wordless emotion. Oh, it appears that my son prefers to announce himself, said Mr. Pettibone, with a queer shake in his voice. For the land's sake, murmured Miss Bennet, when did it come? This morning, early, uh, to be exact, at almost precisely seventeen minutes past four. Philura, I mean Mrs. Reverend Pettibone, is she... Uh, the minister cleared his throat. Obviously, he was listening with some uneasiness to the persistent sounds from above. 
they ceased suddenly and he drew a relieved breath oh mrs pettibone is uh, i am pleased to tell you uh, that she is um as well as can be expected i suppose inferred miss bennett nodding her head sagely there ain't much more to be said the morning after she spoke with certain knowledge of that dread valley of the shadow which her friend had lately traversed an expression of poignant recollection passed over the minister's pale face that my wife is alive this morning he said slowly and able to rejoice with me albeit feebly over the uh, happy event is a matter in in short a subject for um, i'll bet you're both glad it's over broke in miss bennett i know i be and i guess the whole parish will draw a long breath what with her age and all i'll go now and tell miss deaconess buckthorn and she'll pass the word to lecty pratt and be two o'clock everybody in town will know <laughs> mr pettibone shrugged his shoulders resignedly if i was you pursued the spinster i'd muffle this here doorbell so she won't hear it jangling when folks begin to come and inquire and don't you let nobody upstairs i don't care who they be nor what they say some folks has got about as much sense as hens the minister bowed his acknowledgments and murmured something about the doctor's orders and if you should need me for anything settin up nights or like that just let me know i'd admire to do for that baby oh land when i think of philura she turned and went rather blindly down the steps and so out into the street with a total forgetfulness of the paper parcel containing a blue morning wrapper elaborately shirred and trimmed with cascades of white lace the price of which was to have cancelled her growing obligation to mr salter when she did think of it it was to picture to herself the new-made mother holding the infant in her arms it'll be just the thing for it to set up in she told herself happily and to think of me working like all possessed to get it finished in time End of chapter 2Mrs. Buckthorn was at home, her head tied up in red flannel, which lent an awful majesty to her aspect as she bade Miss Malvina be seated in close proximity to the kitchen stove. "'Got neuralgia, Miss Buckthorn?' inquired the dressmaker, rolling her news like a sweet morsel under her tongue. To herself, she thought, she ain't heard it yet for all her party wire. Miss Bennett had not felt able to afford a telephone, a fact of which certain of her customers had taken mean advantage. Mrs. Buckthorn heaved a vast resounding sigh, which appeared to take its rise in the soles of her substantial shoes. "'It's more like neuritis,' she said. "'You ain't never had that, Malvina. "'But the doctor says my nervous constitution is delicate, very delicate. "'No, I know I don't look it, "'but it ain't always size and heft that counts.' "'Thank the Lord it ain't,' said Miss Bennet. "'I don't know where I'd come in if it did. "'I ain't no bigger in a minute and never expect to be, "'but I can whirl in and work equal to the best.' Mrs. Buckthorn eyed the dressmaker searchingly. "'Are you as busy as usual this spring, Malvina?' she inquired. "'Oh, busier,' quoth Miss Bennet stoutly. She met Mrs. Buckthorn's inquisitorial gaze unflinchingly. "'Land, I was saying to Mara only this morning. I'm so drove, I says, I don't know but what I shall have to hire a girl.' not that i like em around cluttering up the shop and setting me half crazy with doing things wrong <laughs> still i says i got to get this here work out of my shop before the summer sewing comes in i says i want to know syllabled mrs buckthorn slowly then she smiled rather disagreeably and moved her large shoulders the dressmaker's thin face reddened i just took home a beautiful new dress to mrs pettibone she said defiantly mm -hmm, murmured mrs buckthorn adjusting the folds of red flannel above her brow i am surprised to hear you say so you be i'd like to know why 
well for one thing i should think under the circumstances our pastor's wife would need to practise the strictest economy i hear she's expecting to employ a trained nurse from boston mrs buckthorn shook her head slowly we all know our pastor's income malvina and we are aware that trained nurses from boston cost thirty dollars a week i don't blame em none contended miss bennett it's cheaper in a funeral you surprise me malvina well maybe i can surprise you some more miss reverend pettibone's baby has come to town with bells it's a boy and he weighs nine pounds miss malvina cast the final item of information in the balance with a lavish generosity which paid no heed to prosaic fact might as well say so she privately excused herself sounds healthy and anyway i'll bet he'll weigh his nine pounds sooner or later well i declare gasped mrs buckthorn a boy a nine pounds oh dressed temporized miss bennett it's kind of chilly weather so they waved him in his clothes <laughs> mrs buckthorn's forehead in so far as it could be viewed beneath the enshrouding flannel appeared deeply corrugated we have a telephone she said coldly and seeing the ladies aid missionary society has lately installed one in the parsonage for the special use of the parish twould seem as though i as president should have been the first to be informed but to hear it from you malvina strikes me as exceedingly oh well he was so flabbergasted and like that he probably didn't give you nor anybody a thought interrupted miss bennett are you referring to our pastor malvina certainly i be probably he didn't get a wink of sleep all night and him being new to the job too <laughs> land he looked like he'd been drawed through a knot hole backwards <laughs> the minute he opened the door i seen something was up but i didn't ask no questions it being my enduring rule not to whatever i see or don't see in my customers houses there's plenty of folks that'd be regular gossips having my exception opportunities so to say not me no i says i shut my eyes and my ears to everything except my business and that's making stylish clothes up to date in every particular <laughs> and i'll defy any woman in this here town what's worn my sewing to show a hook that's come off before its time or a seam that's parted except lawful on account of some customers being too fleshy which nobody can't lay to my door it being the work of our maker Miss Malvina paused for breath, and Mrs. Buckthorn, who had apparently been lost in gloomy retrospection, again fixed a searching gaze upon her visitor. "'You tell me you did not display curiosity,' she said. "'Did Mr. Pettibone inform you of what had taken place?' Miss Malvina chuckled. Oh, "'He done it himself,' she replied. "'Just squawked right out. "'You ought to have heard him. "'Guess he was hungry, "'for he stopped all of a sudden "'like somebody corked him up with... "'Malvina Bennett, "'do you mean to tell me "'that our pastor... "'Miss Bennett stared uncomprehendingly "'for an instant, "'and then she burst into cackling laughter, "'rocking herself back and forth "'and slapping her thin knees "'in an ecstasy of mirth.' Oh, for pity's sake, Mrs. Buckthorn, she exclaimed. Your intellect must be some affected by your new rights, or whatever it is that ails you. I meant the baby, of course. Oh, tell you what, that baby's got good, strong lungs. I bet he'll be heard from right along. Mrs. Buckthorn looked much offended. Neuritis, she said majestically, affects the nerves, not the brain, Malvina. No, don't go just yet. I've something to say to you first. Oh, I was only joking, Miss Buckthorn, apologised the little dressmaker, paling before the implacable expression on the large, flaccid face under its coronet of dingy red flannel. 
you and i hope all that knows me must recognise the fact i never take any important step in life without first laying the matter before the throne of grace stated mrs buckthorn in the rotund voice she reserved for prayer meeting platform and conjugal use mm-hmm assented miss malvina seeming to grow smaller in her chair i know you're an awful good woman mrs buckthorn i strive to be intoned that lady and having as i just told you considered the matter carefully and prayerfully i have decided feeling it be my christian duty to henceforth employ the new dressmaker whose name is hobbs i am told though she prefers to be known as madame louise miss bennett was sitting up very straight now a red spot in either thin cheek what did you say to the lord mrs buckthorn when you laid the matter of given me the go-by before the throne of grace as you call it what did i say how dare you ask me such a wicked question malvina bennett and you a professor in the presbyterian church well i'd like to know just how you put it up to the lord replied miss bennett composedly i was thinking maybe you laid it before the wrong throne folks is apt to get things mixed up once in a while especially when they're so much piouser than other folks mrs buckthorn appeared to struggle vainly for utterance but the little dressmaker went on with a fine show of recklessness if you wasn't a regular hypocrite which there's plenty of folks in this town as i could name as thinks you be you'd have to own up to the lord that miss malvina bennett always made your clothes honest and strong double stitching all the seams and as stylish as was possible considering how fleshy you be and malvina burst from the outraged mrs buckthorn i refuse to listen to you hm, you can't help listening miss buckthorn crowed miss bennett but i ain't a goin to keep you from your new rights for long i got plenty to do in my shop for folks as just as pious as you be and a lot easier to fit i always thought i'd admire to tell you just what i thought and maybe it'll do you good to think it over a spell after i'm gone one thing you ought to get spanked into you is that real good folks ain't always a blowing their tin horns the way you be and they ain't so set up with their prayer meeting manners as to be a nuisance to their neighbours why even my great cat'll turn tail and run when she sees you a coming in the yard mrs buckthorn and children will make themselves scarce rather than meet you especially if it's sunday and they've been smelling a flower or listening to a bird a singing in the trees miss bennett had risen from her chair and was backing toward the door as she poured forth this fervid torrent of words a joyous energy appeared to emanate from her small person her faded eyes sparkled why you ain't got the faintest idea of being a regular christian she cried even your bible's got so mixed up with holy buckthorn you don't know which is which and that's about all for to-day i shall admire to see you busting out of your plackets when that hob woman gets through with you miss bennett reached the street still scintillating with the joys of combat but as she sped swiftly along under the budding maples the spring wind blowing cold in her face her spirits gradually fell oh, i guess i went and made an awful fool of myself she reflected never once stopping to think of deacon buckthorn owning the roof at covers us and me behind with my rent and expecting to settle up with mrs buckthorn's spring dressmaking as usual oh, good land what be i going to do if all my customers leaves me seems as though the lord wasn't so mindful of his own as the minister was telling last sunday she went two blocks out of her way to pass trimmer's dry goods store yes there was her rival's resplendent sign in fresh gold letters on a black ground madame louise robes repeated miss malvina aloud hm, sounds like a funeral director robes well i'd like to see the way she finishes off a dress waist inside if i wasn't afraid of running into some of her customers i'd just step up them stairs and cast my eye around i bet i could tell inside of two minutes what sort of a female miss hobbs is and what she can do in the dressmaking line 
she dallied with the glittering temptation to the point of crossing the street then with one foot on the lower step of the steep staircase leading aloft her courage failed her i ain't got the strength of mind she confessed weakly i guess if i should meet one of my regular customers up there i'd drop dead in a double duck fit some other time maybe the sound of high-pitched voices engaged in earnest conversation on the upper landing lent wings to her feet for two blocks then quite out of breath she stopped to reason with herself all the fools ain't dead yet malvina bennett she told herself with a sniff of strong disdain now just to punish you you turn straight round and march back to that there woman's shop you go up them stairs and you knock on her door what you going to say to her when she comes to the door why you're going to say you want to see miss hobbs that'll take the wind out in her sails first off then you'll think of something to say i'll bet you'll have to there ain't nobody going to hurt you and if you was to meet customers that ain't lady enough to tell you when they're tired of the styles in arts and modes when made up as i do it in my shop i ain't the one to get red around the ears communing thus masterfully with herself miss malvina propelled her unwilling body back to the spot from which she had so lately beat a shamed retreat now here you be malvina now you go on up them stairs business is business and don't you forget that for a minute you got to know what you're up against if it ain't nothing to be scared of you'll soon find it out if it is well, you got to know that too but i'll be switched if i'm a-going to be scared of a bogey in under the bed at my time o life the awe-inspiring words madame louise robes were repeated in flourishing gold script on the curtained glass door above miss bennett paused to inspect them sternly i suppose george trimmer done that much to rent his rooms she told herself no them handsome gold letters won't bite you malvina no they won't help her none if her sewing ain't good but her trembling hand obstinately declined to aid and abet the bold project she had in mind be you telling me you're scared to knock on that there door malvina sneered miss bennett do you suppose there's a bold constrictor on the other side eh his chops all a slavering and ready to swallow you all well if there is you got to pass that there door all the same you hear me she was spared a final effort of will by the sudden opening of the door in question a buxom girl confronted her on the threshold with a quick stare of recognition behind the girl stood a tall thin woman her face twisted in an artificial smile End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Why, well, Miss Malvina, stammered the girl, I didn't know. Mm-hmm, confirmed the little dressmaker. Tain't nobody else, and tain't my ghost neither. If you'll step into the reception parlour, madam, simpered the tall woman, adjusting her frizzes, I shall be at liberty as soon as I've finished with a lady in the fitting department. Miss Bennet, her equanimity fully restored for some reason which she would have found it difficult to explain, stepped boldly past the round-eyed girl. Why, well, yes, she said, I shan't mind setting a spell while you're finishing off that lady's fitting in the department you were speaking of her keen eyes were busy with the woman's dress noting a straining seam under one arm the slanting sag of the skirt over the left hip and the way in which certain showy trimmings had been applied to the waist the maker of robes appeared in no haste she stood eyeing miss bennett's small person doubtfully you'll find the latest fashion magazines on the stand she said indicating a speciously varnished table littered with riotously coloured presentments of long-limbed ladies thank you mrs hobbs but i'm pretty tolerable familiar with the spring styles returned miss bennett easily you're the new dressmaker i presume i am madame louise to the public stated the tall lady I want to know chirped miss bennett well 
to the public and other folks too i'm miss malvina maybe you've heard of me the tall lady shook her head she was a stranger in innisfield she said simpering and twisting her long neck to look sideways at miss bennett who continued to sway back and forth in a rocking chair with great apparent enjoyment well explained miss bennett i just stopped in i won't say friendly but i thought i should like to take a look over some of your sewing i don't care if it ain't more than half finished off all i want is to cast my eye casual over what you call a robe you would like to examine some of my work that's what i said louisa i'd like to take a look at the inside of one of your dress waists and take a squint at the way you finish off your plackets and like that same as if i was going to have one of them robes made up for myself you don't mind i suppose uh, why no i don't know as i have any objections to showing you an unfinished garment hesitated the woman though your request is rather unusual most ladies trust my taste and skill you don't say commented miss bennett that don't strike me like good or sense seeing no lady in innisfield knows you i should think it would be a real good idea to have a sample robe to show inquirers madame louise appeared curiously disconcerted by the suggestion she murmured something incoherent which miss bennett dismissed with an airy gesture well aren't you a customer she said briskly i shan't mind settin for a spell i got plenty to think about mrs hobbs scuttled hurriedly behind a dingy red hanging which afforded miss bennett a fleeting glimpse of a female figure in the familiar deshabille of the fitting-room my gracious she murmured to herself if that ain't miss obed salter oh, if she should catch me in here it would be all over town by supper time for an instant the little dressmaker meditated cowardly flight then she stiffened herself resolutely i don't care if she does she told herself let the whole of em talk i'll tell miss salter right out what i'm after if she asks me i ain't a-going to take no back seat in this ere town anyway it'll be cheap advertising pleased with this conceit miss malvina continued to sway placidly back and forth her ears brazenly alert for scraps of the conversation which floated out from the curtained seclusion of the fitting-room do you think i need any padding in under my left shoulder blade inquired mrs salter's thin nasal voice i generally have some right there where my chest kind of caved in i ain't had no lung to speak of on that side for years and years the doctor says i'm a livin miracle madame louise's reply was inaudible and mrs salter presently went on i've had most of my suits made up by a dressmaker here in town but she ain't got no more idea of style miss malvina's thin face crimsoned with indignation she leaned forward eagerly in her chair to hear mrs hobbs comment to the effect that country dressmakers were generally lacking in style oh, we are so glad and thankful you come to innisfield pursued mrs salter soulfully how'd it happen uh, what oh me coming here inquired mrs hobbs whose utterance indicated a mouthful of pins mm. <clears throat> well of course i wouldn't mention it to everybody mm. but i've seen better days mrs salter mm -hmm. um, time was when i had my own costumes imported from paris for the land's sake ejaculated mrs salter from paris oh i want to know but i always had such taste so when my dear husband if you'll just turn round a little that's right now um, <clears throat> i guess we're through for to-day oh no no don't come to-morrow there's a lot of ladies coming to-morrow the day after uh, no uh, i'm sorry i really couldn't promise mrs salter i'm so rushed 
a pause filled with active rustlings from within presaged mrs salter's advent into the outer room where sat miss bennett her features composed to a strong calm oh well i never faltered the wife of the grocer her lavender tinted complexion becoming curiously spotted with red you seem surprised to see me miss salter commented miss bennett well you could not be down with the feather panted mrs salter i declare ain't that funny well as it happens i got business with louisa same as you have miss malvina turned to the proprietor of the new establishment with a dignity which appeared to propel mrs obed salter out of the door and down the stairs though quite against that lady's will now she said addressing the puzzled mrs hobbs i'll just take a look at the suit you're making up for mrs obed salter it'll be as good as another as far as i'm concerned mrs hobbs sat down rather suddenly oh i ain't used to standing <laughs> she explained these long fittings tire me something fierce miss bennett nodded sagaciously guess you ain't been long in the business she inferred no no not so long acknowledged mrs hobbs but then i always had such a lot of taste she added oh, there's plenty of folks can brag a taste that can't feller seem to save their neck from the gallows commented miss bennett darkly she continued to gaze at her rival who blinked uneasily as if under a searchlight if you was wanting a dress made offered mrs hobbs i guess i can't accommodate you oh not for a month anyway i guess i took in too much as it is and all of them hurrying me she added fretfully Whew, ejaculated miss bennett maybe they won't pester you no more after the first dress you make up for em that's what i'm afraid of murmured mrs hobbs unexpectedly and quite unexpectedly too she began to dab at her purplish lids with a dingy handkerchief i never supposed i hadn't an idea she said and broke off with an obvious effort i sat up until one o'clock last night and the night before trying to finish some dresses but oh for goodness sake why don't you get in some help demanded miss bennett you don't look to me like you had the gumption to whirl in and really so i've got lots of taste and style almost whimpered mrs hobbs but i'm so nervous and when they all take to hurrying me miss bennett arose with a gesture of large renunciation i guess i must be going along she said i got a few things to do myself but thank the lord i ain't nervous and never was if a body knows how to handle their job and gets busy doing it they don't have no time to tend to their nerves i'm real glad i come to see you miss hobbs mrs hobbs followed her visitor's quick bird-like movements with lacklustre eyes you was speaking of my getting in somebody to help she said doubtfully do you would you tell me of anybody miss bennett stopped short as if forcibly arrested by the other woman's question how much would you pay she asked in a queer half stifled voice for a real dressmaker i mean one that knows their business from a tizzard and ain't afraid to whirl in and work oh, there's a friend of mine oh i might get her to uh, to help you out for a spell maybe miss bennett felt herself deeply humiliated by the suggestion she had allowed to escape her that she malvina bennett who had run her own shop for years and years should be reduced to begging for work by the day it was unbelievable it was dreadful and yet there were the three insistent spectres of rent fuel and food which had haunted her night and day through weeks of comparative idleness and there was ma if i could only hold on till fall she was telling herself when mrs hobbs broke in eagerly send your friend round the first thing in the morning 
i'd be only too pleased to pay her two dollars and a half a day if she's what you say miss malvina was silent her eyes fastened blindly upon the doorknob clutched tight in the grip of her slippery cotton glove she could feel her ears burn crimson under mrs hobbs watery gaze well uh, three times six is eighteen computed mrs hobbs yes i declare i'd make it three a day for a while anyway i just got to do something or go raving crazy miss malvina hastily swallowed the round hard lump which had risen in her throat well i'll tell you miss hobbs she hesitated i uh, i spoke kind of hasty my friend hers i was speaking of oh wouldn't hear to going out with the day oh no and i don't believe she'd even come to your shop to see you neither but if i uh, if i was to fetch the work home to her evenings when i ain't busy myself i bet she could do some number one work for you she can sew uh, what do you say to trying her oh, on a dress waist or like that if you don't like her work it won't cost you a red cent if you do it'll be three dollars a day same as you said and regular hours mrs hobbs gripped her visitor's arm oh, come in my workroom just for a minute she urged once behind the breastworks of mrs hobbs establishment miss malvina gasped with the wonder of what she beheld chairs tables even the floor bore evidence of overwhelming success in the shape of inchoate garments of every description a couple of headless figures purporting to counterfeit the female form divine exhibited the more finished products of mrs hobbs genius while a soiled teacup a dispirited dab of butter and a broken loaf shared the table with a lavish supply of spools buttons and parti-coloured trimmings for the land's sake cried miss malvina rolling up her eyes to an unjust heaven there's work here enough for a dozen dressmakers a working day and night for a month what on earth did you take it all in for mrs hobbs gazed about her with a sort of mournful pride the ladies kept coming she said and i hardly knew where to draw the line but i haven't sat down to a regular meal since the first day i came miss malvina sealed up her complex emotions with a prolonged sniff i might as well take a dress waist now she remarked which will it be mrs hobbs reflected her frizzled head supported on one dingy hand well said she i hardly know where to begin there's mrs Bucksmith. oh no that ain't the name um i look it up in the book she's a large lady and she says she wants her dress for divine worship next sunday that's it on the figure there i'm making up a costume for her daughter too oh miss malvina permitted herself to utter and then she sniffed again do you mean to tell me that that there brown and purple is for miss buckthorn i suppose that's what you call a robe <laughs> stylish ain't it <laughs> said mrs hobbs i copied it right off a fashion plate the very latest from cher paris her paris we call it on this side of the water condescended mrs hobbs if you could take that and persuade your friend to finish it off all right said miss malvina briefly i'll take it along right now under cover of the gathering dusk she hurried homeward the large flat parcel containing mrs buckthorn's brown and purple robe under her arm i ain't a going to let ma starve she told herself defiantly i'll finish em off honest oh but land what a set of scarecrows will be coming out of the church by and by i shall admire to see em settin in the pews end of chapter four chapter five of neighbours by florence morse kingsley 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At her own door, Miss Malvina paused. How was she to explain the flat parcel and its alien contents to Ma? Never cross a bridge till you get to it, she muttered, and moved cautiously around to the back door with the unformulated idea of concealing Mrs. Buckthorn's Parisian costume in the wash boiler till Ma should be safely in bed. To her surprise, the door of the kitchen stood wide open, admitting the freakish April wind in furious gusts. Why, Ma Bennett, began Miss Malvina rebukingly, if you don't catch an awful cold with all this fresh air in the house. Then she saw that the kitchen fire was almost out and fell to mending it vigorously. I guess Ma just stepped over to one of the neighbours, she assured herself, and the wind blowed the door open. Mrs. Bennett herself confirmed this hypothesis a moment later. I been in next door, she announced, as she dropped the heavy woollen shawl from her shoulders. It's awful fresh here, Ma, cautioned her daughter. I found the back door wide open. Mrs. Bennett sneezed three times in rapid succession. I guess I catch my death all right, she said complacently. Where you been, Malviny? Me? Oh, I been round town and round. I got some grand news for you, Ma. What? Philura Pettibone's got a baby, Ma. Come to town this morning. A boy, and he weighs ten pounds. Born on a Friday, commented the old lady. And a minister's son at that. That ain't gone hurt him none, contended Miss Bennett, glancing sideways at the incriminating parcel which she had neglected to conceal. Ain't you glad, Ma? I'm tickled most of pieces. Now think of Philura at her age with a real baby all her own. Mrs. Bennett was not listening. She moved stiffly across the floor. Come here, Malviny, she bade her daughter. Look there, will you? Miss Bennett peered through the small paned window in obedience to her mother's pointing finger. I declare, looks like there is a light next door, she said. There is. Land, I ain't seen a light over there for, oh, let me see. It'll be two years come June, wheezed Mrs. Bennett. They moved in this afternoon, just after you went downtown. I was settin' by the kitchen window when I seen em come. Now I guess you're sorry you went off and stayed two hours. Yes, you did, Malviny. Two hours be the clock, and me here all by myself. No thanks to you, I ain't dropped dead in my tracks, Malviny Bennett, with you off parading the streets like you was sixteen. Now, Ma, don't take on, pleaded the little dressmaker. I, I was kept. I won't do it again. Who's moved into Valora Rice's house, Ma? I declare I thought nobody had ever lived there again. It's a kind and gloomy with all them trees in the yard, and all the old rose bushes and syringes growed most of the second story windows. You couldn't guess if you was to try a year, <laughs> croaked Mrs. Bennett, and then she lowered her voice to an incriminating whisper. They're foreigners. What's more, I'll bet anything they're Catholics. Miss Malvina had gathered her cloak and with it the unfinished costume imperfectly concealed beneath its scant folds. What you got done up in that newspaper so careful, Malviny? demanded the old lady, suddenly alert. Did you find out the name of them strange folks, Ma, and where they come from? parried her daughter. And how do you happen to get acquainted so sudden? Oh, the girl come over to borrow a pitcher of drinking water, and I went over to show her how to start the pump. What's in your newspaper bundle, Malviny? Miss Bennett hastily reconsidered her previous resolve. I guess I may as well tell you, she murmured resignedly. This here is a costume for Mrs. Deaconess Buckthorn. I brought it home to finish. Bidet's work, and I'm always glad to accommodate. Oh, yes, I know you be, agreed the old lady mordantly. 
well if miss deaconess buckthorn's taken to doin her own dressmakin all i got to say is it's about the most unchristian act with us a stupendin on sewin for the victuals we put in our mouths there's somebody knockin at the front door malviny miss bennett caught up the kerosene lamp from the table maybe it's somebody come to look over the fashion plate she said hopefully you set the kettle over ma and put that johnny cake in the oven to warm as soon as we've et i got to whirl in and finish that costume for miss buckthorn she's got her mind made up to wear it sunday morning to what she calls divine service oh, goodness knows why against the dim background of swaying trees the open front door revealed a small frightened face and miss bennett became hazily aware of wide dark eyes a tumbled mass of curls and the scarlet curve of parted lips you pardon madame began the unexpected visitor but my father is become sick of a sudden could you of your kindness chez madame tell me of a doctor well i want to know <laughs> ejaculated miss malvina shielding the wind-blown lamp with the crook of her elbow are you the strange girl just moved in next door oh walk right in do oh a thousand thanks madame but it is impossible my father suffer just you wait a minute till i go and tell ma and i'll run over with you volunteered miss bennett eagerly guess i better stop long enough to catch up a shawl and count of my neurology but the girl had disappeared when malvina shawled against the wind finally returned after appeasing the curiosity of ma the little dressmaker made her way through a gap in the ancient hedge which separated the two yards and finding the side door of the old rice house ajar walked boldly in by the wavering light of a candle which merely served to accentuate the gloom she beheld a dense clutter of bales boxes and the stark outlines of crated furniture and in an armchair drawn close to an open window the huddled figure of a man he was groaning loudly monotonously while the girl besought him to drink from the cup she was holding to his lips well for goodness sake commented miss malvina ain't this a pretty kettle of fish your pa's sick and not a bed to put him in say what you givin him in that cup some good art to make a ginger or a dose of perry davies painkiller will generally stop the gripes oh, if that's what ails him have you got any hot water the girl shook her head the fire it will not burn i give him wine but he will refuse as you see miss malvina considered her head on one side like a sagacious sparrow well she said first off i'll dash over to lecty pratt's she's got a phone and i'll call up the doctor of course if it was ma or me i'd take perry davis but i don't know nothing about your pa's constitution i'll be back in two jerks of a lamb's tail and kindle a fire in the kitchen stove we got to have hot water anyhow the doctor a big gruff man arrived in a snorting little automobile before miss malvina had succeeded in starting a reluctant flame in the long unused stove no wonder it won't draw muttered miss malvina indignantly just look at that there stove pipe fairly et up with rust i'll go over and get my oil stove dr north stared thoughtfully at miss malvina over the rim of his spectacles as if the sight of the little dressmaker her second best black hair front pushed rakishly to one side was a new and surprising one he had already jammed his hat well over his eyes and was drawing on his gloves miss malvina was familiar with this wordless verdict as were most innisfield folks to whom the good doctor stood as a merciful arbiter of fate between the here the heretofore and the hereafter then he ain't dangerous she inferred he's hungry and done up with moving growled the doctor neither of them have eaten a bite since morning get him some good hot tea and a boiled egg soft mind you and a good thick slice of bread and butter then put him to bed with a hot brick at his feet he'll be all right in the morning 
Miss Malvina cast a hasty glance about the mouldy old kitchen. Whatever possessed them to light down here, she projected after the doctor's retreating back. Seems as the more foreign folk are, the less sense they got. The simple idea of taking on like that over an empty stomach. But it was not without strenuous and manifold exertions that Miss Malvina succeeded in carrying out Dr. North's simple prescription. There was bread in the house, it appeared, a queer, long, crusty loaf. All rind and no bread, pronounced the little dressmaker disapprovingly. Two eggs, a pinch of tea, and an infinitesimal pat of salty butter she abstracted from her own dwindling stores, to the tune of Ma Bennett's reproaches. You're more than welcome, she told the girl warmly. We shan't never miss that drawing of tea, no the eggs neither. Our hen laid em. But the invalid opposed a fretful torrent of French to the weak decoction of green tea that Miss Bennett presently offered him. I guess he'll make out, was her well-founded opinion, if he can gabble that away. Is he saying anything in particular? Now you get this ear egg down him if you can. Then set down and swaller a bite yourself. The first thing we know we'll have you keeled up. The girl looked sweetly puzzled. I know not what is killed, she said, but first I must prepare the vin brûlée. It is that my father requests, not being accustomed to drink thé verte, but thanking you one mille fois, chère madame. I said you was more than welcome, being neighbours, though foreign, chirped the little dressmaker. But I ain't what you might call a madam not being a married woman nor yet wantin' to be so i'll trouble you to call me miss malvina bennett i s'pose you know it's downright wicked to put the bottle to your neighbour's lips let alone your pa's she added sternly as the girl set a basin of wine over the oil burner i guess we'll have to get a white ribbon pinned on to you maybe it's a leadin' of providence you come to dwell in our midst the girl, understanding merely that some sort of introduction had been offered, showed the edges of her white teeth in a shy smile. My father is too ill for polite, she said gently, but you will permit me to acquaint to you, mon père, Monsieur Etienne de Say, Miss, Miss Malvina Bennett, supplied the good Samaritan, all at once aware of her false front which had slid down over one ear, revealing a mass of curling white hair, wind-blown into a maze of glistening silver. "'I guess I look a fright,' she added, as the man's dark eyes suddenly fastened themselves upon her. He had struggled to his feet, and was bowing low. Then, before she had become aware of his further intent, he had taken her hand in both his own and raised it to his lips, murmuring broken words of gratitude. Me, my name is Madeleine, the girl offered with a quaint little curtsy. I have most great happiness to know you, Miss Malvina. My stars, gasped the astounded Miss Bennet. I guess it's high time your pa was got to bed before he gets to raven. I'll just run over home and fetch a hot brick, like the doctor said. She was glad to hide her agitation in the friendly darkness outside. To think of that foreign man actually a kissing my hand, she said to herself as she slipped through the hedge. I never heard of such a thing. I wouldn't durst tell Ma. And him a supping down hot wine like it was a cup of tea. I guess you see your duty cut out for you, Malvina Bennett. Maybe you'll find you can exert an influence as well as other folks. More special when the opportunities plump right down in your side yard, so to say. It was a singularly flushed and complacent Miss Malvina, who finally sat down to a belated repast of dry cornbread and boiled tea. Ma Bennett, it appeared, felt herself justified in displaying a large assortment of injured feeling. I got such an awful sinking at the pit of my stomach, she complained. I can't eat. And all from waiting on you, Malviny. Swallow some hot tea down first off, Ma, advised her daughter. It'll cheer you up. 
that was just what ailed him but he wouldn't drink his tea after i fixed it all nice for him with milk and sugar and you ought to have heard the heathen lingo he got off but she said he wanted hot wine did you ever if miss deaconess buckthorn was to hear tell of that she'd take him in a blue pledge card to sign said ma they're getting all they can to trim up the church for temperance sunday looks real tasty too all them blue and red cards strung up on yellow cord allowed her daughter but i ain't a goin to have miss buckthorn button in on this job i took it upon myself ma and don't you tell nobody what i said ma i'm real earnest to do some work for the lord maybe i could get a star or two in my crown that a way and according to her own tell miss buckthorn will be so trimmed up with em she'll beat the apostle paul <laughs> now if you'll rinse up these few dishes ma i'll whirl in and sew as hard as i can till midnight i want to get in an hour in the morning to help them folks next door get settled i don't believe that house has had a broom laid to it in two years oh yes tas malviny contradicted the old lady first thing i see was deacon scrimger i guess he had the rentin of it he come along in his wagon and hitched long about two o'clock i seen him go in the front door after a spell he carries out three kitchen chairs and a lookin glass and like that and puts em in his wagon i s'pose likely they was left in the house when philura rice moved over to the parsonage after she married the minister anyhow he kept a bringin out old broken stuff till there was quite a wagon load after that i seen him take a broom and dustpan mrs bennett interrupted the flow of her remarks to carry the milk pitcher to the pantry when she returned her daughter was surveying the unfinished costume she had removed from its wrappings and spread upon a chair poignant dismay was depicted upon miss malvina's small anxious face did you ever see anything like that she was saying to herself not one of them seems bound nor even overcast and you can see where it's pretty nigh busted out already in the back of the arm sizes just from trying on when you think of the way miss buckthorn leans forward on the pew back during the long prayer it's easy to see what'd happen my land if ever i see a dress thrown together and that there madam calls it a robe malviny bennett shrilled the old lady excitedly where'd you get that dress oh it was given to me to finish off ma said miss malvina realizing the maternal presence too late i'm going to get good money for doing it paid right down in my fist but i don't know what to do about them seams they won't last out one wearing be careful ma i don't know as it'll stand much handling the old lady her thin lips puckered into a sagacious knot was peering at the creation of mrs hobbs genius do you mean to tell me malviny bennett that miss deaconess buckthorn done that and if she gave it to you to finish off i ain't a goin to tell you nothin said miss malvina with a fine show of firmness tain't none of our business who done it ma all i know is i got to put my hand to the plough and do somethin to keep that dress waist from bustin out in church disgraceful tell you what i'm going to take them arm sizes and double stitch em an angel from heaven couldn't do no more the loud whir of miss malvina's sewing machine drowned a highly coloured description of her childhood going back to the notable day when ma bennett had seen her duty and done it to the extent of snipping her daughter's youthful tongue with a pair of sharp scissors for telling a wicked lie miss malvina had carefully laid aside her second best false front and her abundant white hair curled recklessly over her small head as she ripped and snipped and stitched being careful to preserve the astonishing ensemble of the purple and brown costume it's enough to make a cat laugh she muttered to herself when at midnight the striped tabby awoke to stretch her pink jaws to their widest and blinked sleepily at the finished work miss malvina was folding away 
i done an honest half day by the clock the little dressmaker was telling herself as she crept wearily up to bed and that'll give me time to do for em if they'll let me she paused in the act of drawing down her blind to gaze at the house across the hedge and thrilled at sight of a feeble gleam of light in one of the second-story windows of philura pettibone's old house it seems kind of nice and cheerful to have folks livin over there again she murmured even if they be furrin and i think of him a kissin my hand like i was a queen in a history book End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Silas Pettibone's baby, though as yet blissfully ignorant of the fact, was quite as much in the Innisfield public eye as Woodrow Wilson or the Duchess of Marlborough. Indeed, for the first weeks of his life, he might be said to outstrip either of the aforementioned personages in the interest and excitement he stirred up. As Miss Malvina Bennett had foreseen, no sooner had the news of his arrival percolated through the village telephone system, a process materially assisted in its onward course by the prevalent party wire, than the shrill doorbell of the parsonage began to announce numerous visitors from every quarter of the parish. It was almost as thrilling as election day or a church fair. Old neighbours met at the gate or on the minister's front porch and paused to exchange spicy reminiscences of the past, mingled with comments and prophecies concerning the new baby, whom the female portion of the community were privileged to look upon as he reposed in his old-fashioned cradle in the parsonage spare room. The trained nurse from Boston, in her white uniform and stiffly starched cap, opposed an equally stiff resistance to the tide of parochial curiosity which sought to overflow into the chamber beyond, where lay the baby's mother but when mrs deaconess buckthorn happily recovered from her late attack of neuritis mounted the stairs it was felt that all barriers must fall i shall see our pastor's wife of course she had announced to a ring of attendant satellites who followed her progress with eager interest as president of our ladies aid and missionary society it is my privilege and as the sabbath school teacher of philura rice it is my sacred right providentially or otherwise the nurse from boston had descended to the kitchen where mrs wessels was thoughtfully absorbing a cup of tea in an effort to keep up her strength till she could rub off the few pieces of the weekly ironing therefore no stiffly starched presence opposed mrs buckthorn's dignified progress as she sailed past the open door of the room where the baby still unconscious of the greatness thrust upon him was holding court mrs pettibone looking very small and weak as she reposed among her white pillows opened her eyes with a start upon the large sombre figure standing at the foot of her bed mrs buckthorn was gazing down at her with the dubious mixture of curiosity and resignation the minister's wife had noticed at uncounted funerals when the wearer of that large fortress-like bonnet bristling with time-defying feathers advanced to view the remains she gasped a little and glanced about rather wildly for the soothing white linen presence which she remembered had left the room only a moment before in quest of gruel well philura intoned mrs buckthorn i have seen your baby and i felt i could not leave the parsonage without a word with you you're looking as well as can be expected how do you feel mrs pettibone reflected vaguely she hadn't thought much about her feelings since the baby came it was enough to lie quiet and happy in the still room and at intervals find the baby's downy little head and questing mouth against her breast she smiled i am i think i feel very well thank you let me see pursued mrs buckthorn strongly the baby is a week old i believe a week to-morrow corrected the baby's mother when my marie isbel was a week old 
i sat up in a straight-backed chair and read my bible for an hour stated mrs buckthorn and that same day i done the family mendin lord help me deacon buckthorn's socks and the boy's knee pants and all the day after that i was out in the kitchen attending to my household duties as usual i never indulge fleshly lusts by remaining in bed to be waited on by a nurse from boston mrs pettibone trembled visibly and sought for her handkerchief she was still very weak i suppose you know louisa wessels is camped down in your kitchen doing the housework regular by the day pursued her visitor inexorably besides that woman dressed in white that spends all her time waiting on you it must be an awful expense to our pastor but perhaps you haven't thought of that how much do you pay your trained nurse by the week philura mrs pettibone gazed piteously past her inquisitor she was sure she heard the baby crying she raised herself on one elbow the better to listen oh twon't hurt him none to cry said mrs buckthorn i guess the ladies have been weighing him i hope you and mr pettibone wasn't a party to it philura but malvina bennett's been a tellin all over the town that the baby weighed nine pounds when he was born it's an awful thing philura for an immortal soul to start out on its journey through this vale of tears with a wicked lie around its neck if you or our pastor knew and you must have known he weighed only six and a quarter with all his clothes on it was your duty he's been caning broke in mrs pettibone eagerly miss sedgwick weighed him this morning and she said mrs buckthorn wagged her feathers ominously i'm afraid not philura your child looks very feeble to me nothing like mine at the same age and others think so too you ought to be prepared to bow your neck submissive to the lord's will philura i am declared mrs pettibone didn't god give me that baby a delicate crimson had begun to burn in her thin cheeks her blue eyes under their childish brows gazed up defiantly at mrs buckthorn's granite front take care philura warned that lady in a hollow voice your ideas on sacred subjects is getting to be pretty well known in this here community i'm sure i don't know what we're a-coming to when our pastor's wife sets herself up in as understanding the ways of the almighty better than the creeds i'm thankful god's ways are better than the creeds wilfully misconstrued the small lady from among her pillows what did you say philura demanded mrs buckthorn sternly would you be willing to repeat that as standing up among the goats before the great white throne answer me but mrs pettibone harassed by the mingled sounds of her visitor's nasal tones and the continued wailing of the baby seemed incapable of a reply she began to cry instead i see that an awakened conscience is doing its blessed work in your heart philura pursued her tormentor don't hinder it and that reminds me i failed to see your bible anywheres about i thought of course i should find it to hand in this house i should love to read a few words from the psalms and engage in prayer before i leave you need it in pursuance of this pious project mrs buckthorn began rummaging busily amongst the various articles on mrs pettibone's bureau hmm a nursing bottle i thought you'd have to come to it at your age well i declare i guess very few of us would think we could afford a large flask of cologne with the world in need as never before whisky as sure as i live what does this mean in the home of our pastor oh my what a 
terrible example to set before the youth of our community i shall certainly speak my mind to mr pettibone before i leave this house and still i find no bible but perhaps your nurse from boston has concealed it in one of the bureau drawers what a sad story i shall have to tell if i cannot find that blessed book well i must say i am surprised and grieved philura extravagance and display are surely out of place in the parsonage if nowhere else comfort and cleanliness do not call for embroidery and no lace such as i see on these here garments and still no bible oh, but i do find here halt on the care and feeding of infants is this a proper substitute for your bible philura mrs pettibone had hidden her face in her pillow she was thinking confusedly that she must not listen to what mrs buckthorn was saying that she must be calm quite calm and tranquil otherwise the baby might have the colic miss sedgwick had said so and miss sedgwick knew mrs buckthorn had carried on her pious quest as far as the washstand when she was deflected from her purpose by the sudden appearance of a tall erect person panoplied in spotless white and bearing a napkin tray in the midst of which was set forth a steaming bowl this individual spoke no word but there was that in the militant gleam of her eyes which caused mrs buckthorn to hastily abandon her self-imposed task i was just looking for our pastor's wife's bible she explained but her voice had somehow lost its fearsome quality i didn't see it nowheres around on the mantel-shelf nor the table no confirmed the white linen presence briskly i took all the books downstairs the first thing they harbour dust and germs she held the door invitingly wide i don't allow visitors she added you may tell the others the wailing baby was being vigorously trotted upon mrs scrimger's knee while an admiring and resourceful audience looked on when mrs buckthorn appeared much ruffled as to her spirits did you see philura how does she look i wonder if i might step in just for a minute uprose in unison that woman from boston began the wife of the senior deacon is a child of belial if ever i see one she actually had the brass to tell me with a sudden swoop of ample white draperies the woman from boston descended upon the group of matrons and salvaged the baby you will have to excuse me ladies but it makes my patient nervous to hear him cry she vouchsafed over her shoulder as she bore away the small bundle of lawn and flannel there followed the sound of a door firmly closed well did you ever mrs scrimger wanted to know oh ain't we stylish contributed miss electa pratt with a girlish giggle i ain't said anything to you ladies about it before but now that ma's passed away i been thinking of taking up nursing myself and i offered to do it for philura and the minister pouring his tea and things like that for nothing but it seems i wasn't good enough for her she said mr pettibone wanted a trained nurse all of us ladies could have took turns sighed mrs buckthorn the thought had come to me and what a blessing our consecrated zeal might have proved in this here household prayer and praise from morning till night are going up like an altar of sacrifice maybe it would have turned out to be one mused mrs puffer who had just run over with an extra crib blanket but when pressed for an explanation the little woman blushed very pink indeed and said she guessed she didn't mean anything much she added that being so constantly with the children made her sort of absent-minded that same afternoon as was his custom the reverend silas pettibone emerged from his study 
where he had spent the morning endeavouring to wrest the meaning from a cryptic Pauline saying, and ascended to his wife's room. "'Well, my dear,' he began, after kissing the shining pale face upturned to his, "'I hear Mrs. Buckthorn called to see you this morning. She stopped in the study on her way out. I was rather sorry. I am... Um, I'd supposed Miss Sedgwick had a... Uh, interdicted... <laughs> the nurse who was engaged in folding large squares of white cheesecloth into infinitesimal triangles turned quickly around the woman sneaked in sir when my back was turned for an instant she said i don't know what she did to put my patient all in a tremble but i shall turn the key in the lock after this when i go down to the kitchen you won't leave her sir while i run out for half an hour if i thought you would mr pettibone was instant and earnest in avowing his purpose of guarding the sick-room against further intrusion but still the cautious miss sedgwick hesitated somebody might call to see you sir and while you were downstairs take advantage you could put the baby on the bed silas and lock the door suggested mrs pettibone there was an eager gleam in her eyes which again halted the departing footsteps of authority better leave him just where he is the nurse said firmly he is not hungry and he is perfectly comfortable if he should cry please remember a certain amount of crying is good for a baby her clear eyes fixed upon the minister appeared to demand some sort of guarantee of obedience oh, certainly said mr pettibone quite right I will leave the infant exactly as he is now placed in that crib. I see you have him very firmly enmeshed, oh, perhaps I might better say constricted beneath his bed coverings. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, I should have said <laughs> the infant is quite comfortable, Miss Sedgwick repeated with a touch of asperity. Do not disturb him during my absence. The sound of her firm footsteps retreating down the passage, followed later by a rustling descent of the stair and the distant closing of the front door, marked a period during which Mr. Pettibone sat by his wife's side, decorously perusing a work on the social conscience, while Mrs. Pettibone, very demure and bright-eyed, watched a sunbeam coquetting with the muslin curtains. Now, Silas, she said softly, Mr. Pettibone glanced down at her with a humorous smile. But my dear Philura, he murmured, that excellent person extracted an actual promise from me today. Possibly, <laughs> possibly she suspects us of collusion. I fear I didn't get the trick of that tightly bandaged sheet over the infant's body. Um, let me read you an illuminating passage I've just lighted upon. Oh, Silas, please. I haven't half looked at him yet. I feel exactly as if he was her baby. She won't allow me to hold him. Anyway, we can't afford to keep her any longer with Mrs. Wessels in the kitchen. I must begin to take care of him myself and do things. Please let me. Mr. Pettibone ruffled his iron-grey hair with an impatient hand. I should like to give utterance to something forceful concerning Mrs. Buckthorn, he began. Of course, I can guess the sort of thing she said to you this morning. Oh, but it was all true, I'm afraid, murmured his wife. I can't help feeling guilty and extravagant when I think of what I'm costing. Mr. Pettibone arose and very deliberately tiptoed his way across the room to the crib, where lay his son peacefully asleep. I am about to perjure myself, I fear, but I think we need to discuss this subject in the presence of the entire family. With this remark, he skilfully extricated the infant from his well-ordered blankets and bore him to the bed where he deposited him, all pink and squirming, at Mrs. Pettibone's side. Oh, Silas, she cried in an ecstasy. I'm afraid you've waked him up. Oh, do look at his eyes. He's looking straight at you. I wonder if his eyes will be dark like yours. They're blue now. Oh, just see. And his hair is curly right on top of his head. Oh, you darling. Uh, speaking of expense, 
pursued Mr. Pettibone logically. He's worth all the cost, isn't he? To you and to me. And I shall never forget that he nearly cost you your life. If I had lost you... Mrs. Pettibone hid her eyes in the baby's neck. I'd forgotten it already, she murmured. It seemed a sacrilege to mention anything so sordid as money at such a moment. But after a period of blissful contemplation, the minister produced a roll of soiled bills from his pocket. Filthy lucre, he announced, amounting to one hundred and fifty-three dollars. Oh, Silas! On account of arrears on my salary, he exulted. Our good brother George Trimmer handed it to me last evening after prayer meeting. He tells me he hopes to have the full amount by the end of the month. Mrs. Pettibone drew the blanket softly about the baby with gentle little pats and cuddles. Oh, I'm ashamed of myself, she said. Why? Because I ought to have known the money would come. I ought never to doubt or be afraid of anything, now that I have you and him. No, you ought not, he agreed, a humorous smile touching his grave lips. And you mustn't. Do you know... I find myself singularly dependent on you, Miss Philura, for my spiritual uplift. Whereat they both laughed, in memory of old days, happily past now and well-nigh forgotten. Another proof that a beneficent providence has not failed us, my dear, appears in the fact that your house is rented at last. Oh, Silas, she said again. Really? Indubitably and your new tenants have paid their first month's rent in advance. Here it is, less Deacon Scrimger's lawful commission and the fee to the Boston agent, who really disposed of the house for you. He paused to observe his wife's face, glorified with a look of rapture which the insignificant sum of money he placed in her hand failed to explain. It's for the baby, she said. Out of the encircling good! End of chapter 6